Good morning. So I'm going to take you from the very declarative world of uh, logic programming to the very stateful world of uh, de debuggers. Yeah, so as uh, Stuart said, I have a lot of uh, open source projects. Um, I work full time on, on Pallet. I do consulting around Pallet. So it keeps me busy and lets me uh, spend all my time in, in the closure world. So um, I'm going to be talking about RITS, which is a, an open source library uh, to add debuggers to, for, for closure. Um, at the moment, it works uh, with Emacs, uh, various Emacs clients. Uh, but the first part of my talk should be uh, applicable to, to uh, other clients as well. So whether you're using Eclipse or, or Emacs, uh, hopefully you'll find something of interest here. So a bit of a history. Um, George Jahad really started the, the ball rolling with debugging in Clojure. Uh, he wrote a, a library called Debug Repl, uh, which was based on the uh, realization that uh, you could put a form into your code, a macro into your code, and use the closure in, internal closure environment to set up a, uh, an evaluation environment where you could uh, enter arbitrary expressions and evaluate a, a, an expression with the local context. And uh, that led to um, the and env uh, pseudo uh, argument to, to macros being introduced to, to Clojure. Um, I, came to, I came to Clojure uh, after Common Lisp. So I was very used to using Slime and Common Lisp. And I really liked the, the, the debugger SLDB in, common, in, in Slime that works with Common Lisp. And, uh, I really missed that when I came to Clojure, so uh, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd try and do something about that. So I, I ended up talking to Phil, uh, who was looking after Swank Clojure, and uh, he su su suggested that uh, I uh, put debug REPL into Swank Clojure. So I ended up doing that, and that gave us uh, the, the Swank break form uh, that many of you still use. Uh, and that all works very well. It has some limitations, only lets you in, uh, look at locals in a single frame. And it also means that you have to uh, modify your source code to put in a, a, the Swank break form and recompile to be able to, use, to debug anything. So luckily, the, the JVM platform itself provides a debugger. And it's called the JBT, JPDA, is the name of the overall environment. And the JDI is the Java debug interface. It's the, the Java interface to that. So um, after that, George and I, in parallel, unknown to each other, kind of worked, uh, started working on um, hooking up the, the Java, uh, the JVM debug environment to Clojure. And George wrote a library called CDT, uh, Clojure Debug Toolkit. And I started work on what was become RITS, uh, which started life as a, as a, a fork of uh, Swank Clojure. So, um, yeah. so um, the RITS I got working uh, uh, within the Slime environment. So it's been working for over a year. Um, I use it every day. Essentially, it's my, my go-to environment. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in the last year, uh, NREPL has, has come to be. Uh, Chaz's project uh, that uh, uh, really has uh, the, the, um, the vision behind that is that you, you can have a, a, a closure process. It's your user process that runs an NREPL server. So that's a little, little server inside it. And then you talk to that server over a wire protocol or over the network and you can attach clients to, to your, 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 your uh, closure process. Uh, it's much like the, the Swank and Slime, if you know, if you know those. Um, but the, the vision was to have a, a, a way of doing this that was uh, open to, to other, client, uh, other clients that weren't necessarily coded in, in Lisp. So um, the default transport in, in NREPL is, is based on sockets and be in code for, as, a, as a format for, for messages. So NREPL works by passing messages backwards and forwards between the, the client and the, and the server. And the other, the other big component of, of NREPL is the, the middleware stack, uh, which I'm going to be explaining in a little bit more detail. 
So this is a, a little example of, of what I mean by uh, middleware. Uh, should be fairly familiar if you've ever done any ring work, uh, work with ring. Um, this is an example where um, we got the, the, the client on the, on the right, on the left, and the, the, your user process on the right. You got the client, uh, you want to load a file, so it's just going to send a little message to, to the, the, the server, and this message has got an, an op uh, field in it, it just says load file, and then on the server there's a, as a handler uh, that, that receives the message and essentially looks, uh, goes through the, the different middleware that it has uh, loaded in, in the server process until it finds the, the middleware that handles the, the, the load file operation. And then it's going to, um, actually, that middleware is going to load the file and asynchronously send back a, a reply to the, to the client to say that the file has been loaded or not and uh, the client can, can handle a notification. Now, there are a couple of interesting aspects to this. Uh, the first is that you can uh, have a client that can support multiple, lang uh, multiple versions of Clojure on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the user process side. So whether you're running uh, Clojure or Clojure script, your client can just say load file, and the actual code that gets executed can be different in the two cases. So it allows you to work with, with different variants of Clojure with the same client without the, having to modify the client. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the, you can use, uh, if you have, say, a, a middleware to do code completion. Uh, there are various different ways you can do code completion. So, say you have a, a simple code completion, just takes a, a prefix that you've typed in and tries to find a, a, a symbol that matches that prefix. Um, but you can also have what, what Emacs calls uh, fuzzy completion, where you, you you type in some symbols and it tries to uh, type in some characters and it tries to find a, a symbol that matches, uh, that has those characters in those orders but not necessarily contiguously. So, um, and which version, you, which, which type of completion you want to use is really a personal preference. So, um, it, it's kind of nice to be able to just say, okay, I want to have uh, fuzzy completion in all my, all my REPLs. Um, independently of which particular client you're attaching uh, to that rep, uh, using for, for your REPL. So it, it gives you a way of customizing the, your, your REPL environment independently of, of the client, which I think is, is great. So I'm just going to explain how, how you can do that. Um, Linigan 2 has this um, concept of profiles uh, to, to customize different environments uh, within, within Linigan. So uh, in, in your home directory under the, the .line directory, you can set up a profiles.closure file. And in there, you can set up your user profile. And the, the user profile is a, a special profile in Linigan. It gets applied to all, all, your, all your REPLs. So independently of whichever project, it's always there. So you can specify middleware in, in, in your, in your profiles.closure file, and it just appears in uh, that middleware will then be used in, in every REPL you start in all your projects. Uh, the other way you can do it is in the dev profile in your, in your uh, project.closure file. So, and, and, and then you can set up something that's project specific. And you can do more than that. You can actually set up arbitrary profiles and then say line with profile XXX, and it will start up with those options. So a very flexible system and a great feature of, of line two. So there are various uh, clients already for NREPL. Uh, Reply, Colin Jones's project is uh, the REPL you get if you just type line REPL. Uh, Laurent Petit has a counterclockwise, uh, which is the Eclipse uh, environment for closure. Uh, and, and I know Michael Brandmeier is uh, working on support for NREPL in Vim closure. I don't think it's quite there yet, but getting there. So there's a huge community involvement in NREPL, and it's, uh, it's great to see everyone getting involved. And the, the final client I haven't mentioned yet is NREPL.EL. So NREPL.EL is being driven by Tim King. Um, it's an Emacs client for, for NREPL, and the idea is to be able to replace uh, Slime with a closure-specific uh, 
client that uh, can uh, do closure-specific things and not necessarily be encumbered by supporting co common lisp or scheme or any of these other things. So um, I was going to go through quickly how to install that. So nripple.el is an Emacs uh, package. So to install it, you have to uh, tell Emacs uh, where, to, where to get it from. There's a package archive called Marmalade. And basically, you just add, add Marmalade to your, uh, to your uh, package archive list. And, uh, and, and you can install it. And there's a, a second package archive called Melper, uh, which is a little different if you want to live really on the bleeding edge of nripple.el. Uh, Melper contains a package that's built automatically from, from the Git repo. Uh, so, but for, for most uses, usage, just concentrate on using Marmalade. Okay, so, so to actually install nrepl.el, uh, alt x package install nrepl. That's fairly simple. And uh, once you've got that installed, then you actually have to start a, a REPL session and connect to it. Uh, one way to do that is to do it all in one. There's a command nrepl jackin. If you, if you run this from within a .closure file uh, within your project, it will start to, it will go and find the, the relevant project file, start a server for you, and connect to it. You can also do it separately. If you run a, a line REPL headless, uh, that will start a, a, a REPL server that uh, uh, doesn't have a client attached to it, and then you can uh, alt x n REPL and point that to, to the REPL. And there are various other ways of starting your REPL other than line REPL, so. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Oh, which brings us back to Ritz. So Ritz uh, started off as a, a fork of Swank closure. Um, I never meant it to really be a, a fork. I always meant it to, to reintegrate it into Swank closure, but just diverged so far in the end that it wasn't possible. Um, uh, and uh, I spent uh, during the last year, I've re refactored it to, to include uh, NREPL support as well as Slime support, so it now supports the two. And, and split it into many different components. So at the bottom, we have a, a REPL utils layer, which contains all the, the implementation details of, of what was in uh, Swank closure, so all the code completion, um, uh, apropos support. Um, so all the, all the features of, of, of Swank closure are now in this REPL utils library which is a, a, a zero dependency library that you could use. Uh, you can include it in any of your user processes without any conflicts um, and can be used to support um, REPL type uh, uh, functions in, in any REPL environment. So it's not linked to Emacs, it's not linked to nREPL, it's, it's just an independent library. And then on top of this REPL utils, uh, uh, we now have uh, nREPL middleware, middleware which is a separate library that just uh, wraps nrepl uh, the, the, the base level REPL utils in uh, middleware that you can use from any nrepl client. So uh, we, you can use the, the Ritz uh, completion uh, or the Ritz apropos in any client that supports the, the middleware operations for those features. I also split out the Ritz debugger into a separate library. Uh, which is independent of Emacs or nREPL or anything else. Um, and on top of that, we now have Ritz Swank and Ritz nREPL, which are the two um, libraries, that, uh, two REPL servers that we actually use for debugging. I'm going to go uh, quickly through some of the middleware that are in, in uh, nREPL middleware. Uh, you've got Java doc, code completion, so all the, all the basic functions for, for a REPL. Um, and there are two more Ritz components. There's a, uh, a nREPL codec, which is a REPL that runs over Hornet queue, uh, which is a message server. So you can run, a me uh, run your REPL over a message queue. Um, and there's an nREPL codec, which is a middleware that um, allows you to pull up the, the, f the history of, of a function. So you can just uh, uh, hit a key chord on a symbol and uh, it will go and look up in a, in a code, in, in codec, 
all the history of that function and, and put it into a separate buffer for you so you can see the, the, the whole history of the function. Um, so part of the, uh, the rewrite um, or the, the refactoring of, of the debugger, I had the, the fortune of having just read out of the tar pit a little late maybe. Uh, I always assumed that Richard had already taken all the good bits of out of the tar pit and put them into closure, so I'd never actually gone through and read the paper, but there's, there's, there's a whole wealth of ideas in the paper. And uh, some of the ones that helped me with this uh, was the, really the concept of isolating mutable state and providing a simple interface to it and, and having no preferred access path to the, the elements within your, within your mutable state. And the paper suggests using relations to do that. Uh, obviously, that doesn't really work for what we were doing, but it maps, uh, using maps. So I use a, a map per connection. And that, that gives a, you can implement the same ideas on top of maps instead of on, on top of relations, and I think that works really well. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite similar to what, uh, in some ways, to, to um, our Datomic as well. So maybe Rich did think of everything from, from out of the top. <laughs> okay, uh, so how does it work? Uh, essentially, to run the debugger, you actually need two two JVM processes. So your client connects to a de debugger process, and the debugger process connects to your user process. So it's a little bit more complicated than the average, uh, uh, the average uh, 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 REPL session. Uh, the, the, uh, the client talks to the debug server over uh, a TCP IP connection. So it's a, a, the standard NREPL uh, connection there. So it's TCP IP, TCP IP and, and Ben code. And then your debug server talks to your user process using the Java debug interface. So it can execute various code using the Java debug interface. The servers themselves are completely independent of the front end. So you can attach to this using, uh, um, you could attach to this using uh, Vim, Vim closure, uh, you could use the server, uh, hopefully, within the mutants, within session. Um, and uh, yeah, ho hopefully, this can become a, a, a default implementation for, for, for debuggers outside of um, JVM-based clients. Also, uh, the Rich debugger comes with some uh, extensions to nrepl.el, which are uh, also provided in a little package. So I'm just going to give you a quick idea of, of how a debugger can work using middleware. I hope that's visible at the back. Um, so the basic idea, we have the, uh, the, the NREPL client on the left, and we have the, the, the de debugger process on the right, and I've, I've dropped the user process, which is behind that. And, and when we start the client, we send a, a, an operation, a, a, an op, a, a, map, a message to the debugger saying, okay, break on exception. So it's saying, okay, from now on, whenever you hit a, uh, an exception, I want the user process to be frozen, and I want the exception information sent back to the client. So there's no immediate reply to that message. It's just sending a, it's, it's uh, providing a message ID that can effectively be used by the debugger to return information, kind of like a form of uh, long polling, if you like. Um, it sends that message. Then the, the client evaluates some code, which is sent as a, an eval op to the eval middleware in, in NREPL. And that gets evaluated, and some, somewhere in that, that evaluation, the, an exception is fro thrown. The debug debugger freezes the, the, uh, the user of the machine, uh, the user process, and then sends back the exception, pro uh, exception information back to the client. The client can then display that in some form. Uh, maybe the, the user then decides he wants to see the, 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 the source code for the first frame. So he sends a message to, he sends a message back to the debugger saying, find me the location of the, the, the first frame. And that sends a message back saying, it's okay, it's in this file at line X. And then the client can display that file at that point in the file. You can then evaluate some code uh, within the context of that frame. So there's a message that says uh, frame eval, 
um, passes the frame number and the code, goes back to the debugger process. The debugger process sets up an environment uh, to mirror the environment in that frame within the user process, evaluates the code, and then sends back the, the result back to the client that can be displayed. So that's completely, um, that interface is then completely independent of the, the specific client that, that, that's, on the, uh, that's running in the client. Okay, to, to use the debugger, uh, you have to package install nrepl.rit. Okay, so from, from now I'm going to be talking about nrepl.el and um, how to use RITs within nrepl.el. So you need to install a little package that's uh, nrepl RITs, which provides some extensions to nrepl.el. And uh, you have to add uh, line RITs to your, your plugins. So in, in, line, in line one, you had the line plugin command. In line two, this is now handled, plugins are now handled through the same profile system. So that's a, a major improvement. So uh, the easiest way to make it available to all your projects is just to add it to your user profile. So once you've done that, you can start a, a, a REPL server uh, with line RITS n REPL. So instead of um, line REPL, line RITS n REPL. That will spit out a port number, and you can then connect to that using the, the ordinary n REPL connection. So I'm not going to show you it. So I've got, uh, I just started the, the, the little REPL earlier. So I'm going to, this is the, the, the port number that the REPL is listening on. So I'm going to connect to that with Altex n REPL. It's going to ask for a host. So you're not limited to, to running the, the clients and the, and, the, and the user process on the same, same machine. And the port. And it's going to connect. So we have a you know, standard REPL. So as I said, uh, break on exception is off by default because um, a couple of issues. And um, some, if you're using a lot of Java libraries that use exceptions heavily for flow control, it can get annoying, so by, it's off by default. But. So we're going to tell, tell it to, to break on exception and in REPL RITS. Uh, okay, somehow it hasn't loaded the in REPL RITS package. Ritz, uh, break on exception. Okay, so now if I uh, enter some code that's going to um, cause an exception, we'll see a, a stack trace. That's going to my examples. Okay, so here I have a divide by zero. So it pulls up the, the stack trace. And you got a, at the top, you've got a description of what the exception is. So you've got the exception type and the, uh, the message for the exception. And this is the, the bit that I really liked about the, uh, the, the common Lisp experience in Slime. You have restarts, so you can control what happens. At this point in time, the, the machine is frozen. The stack hasn't been unwound yet. And you can control what happens. Uh, this is uh, the idea between behind restarts is based on the common Lisp uh, condition system. We're, uh, we're not actually using conditions here. We're kind of just simulating them using the, the Java uh, debug interface. So uh, I can decide what to do here. So if I if I select continue, it's going to throw the exception. And it's going to actually go get caught in the next handler, so it's going to come back up with the, the next catch point. It's going to be rethrown. Re I can abort. And abort means, OK, ignore all the exceptions from now on until they get back to the top level. So it just takes me back to, to there. 
And this is the, at the bottom we see the, uh, the standard uh, nripple.el printing of the, the exception. Okay. Uh, just going to throw that again. One difference to, to a debugger such as, as you find in Eclipse is that the, you control which exceptions are, you see uh, in line in, in, in part, as part of your working flow. So here I can say, okay, I've seen this arithmetic exception. I don't want to see it again. So you can just ignore it, and the program will, will not give you a, it will just continue over that in the next, next time it sees a, an arithmetic expression. And you can ignore exceptions on different criteria. So you can ignore the, a specific type of exception. You can ignore uh, a specific message. You can ex ignore a catch location or a throw location. So you have many different ways of filtering the exceptions that you actually have to worry about and you actually see in your debugger. In uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the Swank version of, of Ritz, there's actually a, um, there's actually a screen um, on the slime selector. Is it uh, slime selector F, which will actually let you then manage those which exceptions you you actually filter, uh, which exceptions are uh, which filters are active, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It doesn't come up too well on here because the the screen is so so narrow. Um, there's one one problem with uh, catching exceptions in um, on, the, on the JVM. Um, and that's, there's no real easy way of uh, deciding which exceptions are caught and which are uncaught. So in, in, in Java, you can filter on caught and uncaught exceptions, which is quite useful. In uh, Clojure, it's less useful because any try finally block effectively catches exceptions. So any binding form, any with open form, effectively catches all the exceptions underneath that. And those are pretty prevalent in pretty much any, any closure program. So it's pretty much useless filtering on, on court and uncourt, uh, which makes the, the whole handling of uh, uh, which filters you, which exceptions you want to see a bit more complex. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to go down now into the, the, the stack trace itself. Uh, you can en hit enter on, the, on a stack trace, and it will show you the local variables within that, uh, not just at the, the first frame, but uh, at different frames. Thank you. You can uh, evaluate uh, expressions uh, within a particular frame context. So in frame one, you hit E, and you can type uh, type two X, and it's going to put put that up at the bottom. So you can ar uh, evaluate arbitrary expressions. With D, you can uh, pretty print the result of that in a separate buffer. So it's handy if you've got some some long expression that's that you're, you're you're evaluating a long result. If you hit uh, V, it'll actually jump to the source code for that frame. So here we're actually jumping to a Java source file. So you can see it's uh, in, the, in, in the divide operation. Um, we pick the our, our eval. Oh, eval didn't work. So I'm just going to continue this now. So for the uh, source, jump to source to work. You have to add the uh, source file to your uh, class path. So for, for non aot closure code, it's automatically there. But if you've got aot closure code or uh, Java code, you need to make sure that the source jars get onto the class path. Uh, there's an easy way of doing that. So line pom will give you a Maven pom pom file, and Maven dependency sources will go and download all the source jars for the dependencies you're using in, in your project and put them into your local repository. And once they're in your local repository, every time you run a Ritz line session, it automatically adds them to the class path. So 
it's just a one-off operation you have to do. Um, so, I'm going to get out of that. Abort. Go back to my example code. Uh, so I have now I have a function divide by zero. Oops. I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to call it. There's my function. Um, and it, so you, you can jump to the, the closure source for that. Uh, it gets a little more, bit more complex uh, where you have locals clearing. So. Uh, Clojure has this, this thing whereby uh, if you have locals within a, a function and they're assigned, uh, the, they have a value that is a, a lazy sequence, they're actually nilled out after the last, last use. And this prevents the, the head of lazy sequences from being held and the whole of your sequence being realized in memory. So if I, if I look at this function and evaluate it as it is, we've got a we've got just got a uh, assigning C to, to be a be the result of a range call. If I evaluate that, um, uh, sorry, yeah, you get compiler exceptions as well. Um, So if we, if we look at this, uh, we were expecting to see C being 0 to 9, a sequence of 0 to 9. We've actually got C, C as nil, and that's the result of locals clearing. So since closure 1.4, we can actually control this uh, a feature that's gone in. Um, so if I just continue to uh, abort that. Uh, I, can, I can compile this with a prefix now. So if I say control U, control CC, it will com compile this with uh, locals clearing disabled. I can now reevaluate re that. And we now have our, our local variables. <laughs> Which is really useful because when, <laughs> when, when everything's nil, you're not sure if it's nil or not. <laughs> Okay. So there are also some, sometimes you get uh, some cryptic error messages from, from Clojure occasionally. <laughs> if you make a, a nice syntax error like uh, defining def multi with some, some uh, incorrect syntax, you get a, uh, an exception that uh, is none too helpful in terms of line numbers. Um, uh, but using this, you can actually see which form is, uh, is causing you your problem. This is, a, this is one I make all the time. Um, uh, defining a namespace with use only, and then forgetting the, uh, the vector around the symbol. Uh, um, oops, forgot to continue the... Continue. I've got a frozen VM now. Okay. I'm gonna have to kill that. Yeah, there are still a few issues in in, in the Enripple version of this. There are a few less in the, the Slime version I've been using for the last year, so it's a bit more tested. Um, all right. So uh, let me kill. Restart that. And it takes a it takes a few seconds to start. There are actually three JVM processes when you're starting. There's the line process, there's the debugger process, and there's your user process. So uh, it just takes a takes a few seconds to start up. So. 
So there we go. So there are some, some other features apart from uh, just the, the, the debugging. Um, I can run uh, line commands in the user process, so without having to start up a different uh, JVM process to run line. So nripple, uh, ritz, line, it asks for the line command. So we're gonna do depths tree. It prints up the, the dependency tree for your project. It's quite useful. I can edit the uh, the project file. Uh, oh, I already had the dependency in there. Uh, let's think of another one we can put in. Anyone have a dependency? Uh, class Lojure. <laughs> class Lojure is a wonderful library that does class, per, cl uh, class loader manipulation. Um, so I've edited my, my project at Lojure. I can say uh, nripple ritz uh, reload project. And it's going to reparse the project, resolve all the dependencies again, and uh, re, uh, add the add the new dependency in a, a child class loader and give it back to you. So um, once it's there, we can uh, require class loader core. Okay, well, it doesn't seem to have worked. So. <laughs> Demo effect. Um, so you can, you can reload uh, project files. You can actually switch projects as well. There's an uh, alt xn repl uh, load project. If you run that in a diff uh, closure file associated with a different project, then it will pull that up. Okay, so um, hopefully I'll show you most things. Just clearing breakpoints. No, I didn't show you disassembly. If you hit capital D on a frame, you actually end up with the, the, the Java bytecode you can inspect, which is quite useful. Um, I'm running out of time, so I won't go through that. You can pull up, uh, I don't suppose you can read that, but uh, you can pull up a nice display of all the threads in your, in your VM. Alt X and REPL RITS threads will give you a table of all the threads. As the project support, uh, Technomancy has a new version of debug uh, REPL that he's working on that should help you um, run debug REPL without having to actually modify your, your, your forms. Okay, so wh where are we going with RITSwank? Um, uh, parity with, uh, sorry, with RITS and REPL. Parity with RITSwank is the first thing, so adding breakpoints. RITSwank actually does breakpoints, so you can hit Control C, Control XB in, in a Java file or a Clojure file, and you get a breakpoint on that, that file, on that, on that line. And uh, uh, that lets you then step through code. Uh, it's not in N Ritz N REPL yet. And then there's some ideas around uh, actually making your, uh, actually making the debugger scriptable. Uh, there's a, a nice paper uh, you, can, you can see in the presentation, uh, in, the, in the slides that uses data flow and, and uh, makes uh, the debugger completely scriptable. And in con so in conclusion, I think uh, the two, two aspects that I want to, to, to really force home is the NREPL middleware is, is really nice. It gives you flexibility of using different clients. It gives you uh, customize, it, uh, customize your REPLs easily and use them from wherever. And uh, I'm really trying to make RITs the place for, for de closure debuggers. So 
If you feel like uh, contributing in this in, uh, in this area, please please uh, please do. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>